Hi there. I'm John McPherson, and this is Jeffrey Schmidt. And Jeff has become in what three years you've been working on these bows, or four? Oh, three years now. Three years. He has gotten to building uh, Asiatic composite bows, and he's built one of well every major country that's built one, the Persians, mm -hmm. the Turkish, the Chinese, the Koreans, uh, Egyptians, and he's shooting, what, eight now you have that are shootable? Eight shootable and five that are being built. So what we're going to do is, first off, we're going to explain what a composite bow is and why we will make a composite bow. Uh, and that's what this little segment of talk is about. And from there, we're going to go step by step through the process of building a bow. And you're going to see this in less than two hours, to subtract minus this gab we got going here. Uh, but you have to realize that to build one of the finished, really good products that we're going to show you is like five or six months worth of work. And to the old Turks, they spent years, wasn't it four or five years they spent? They could spend as much as a decade, but they would build the bows in batches of 500, and during one particular season, they would just perform one operation, such as sinewing, on the entire batch. And then the bows would be seasoned out, sometimes in two or three periods. And it might take 10 years for a batch of 500 bows to be completed from raw materials to the stage where they're being sold. What we're going to show you here uh, is going to be like five months. Just Jeff's average time is five to six months. Then we're going to compress it down. We have bows and Jeff has prepared uh, various stages of everything so that we can run through here in a, uh, like three days we'll be shooting this. You'll see it in an hour and a half. Uh, but also you can build one within a month. We'll show you a quick way to build a composite bow. Well, let's talk bows first. Some of you don't have much for background, possibly, in the physics of archery or uh, boyers. Uh, and a bow is basically, uh, what most people think of is a piece of wood with a string tied at both ends that you bend and you pull this string and throw an arrow, which is just another stick. Well, we've got some wooden pieces here to illustrate this with. This is a a piece of hickory that's been worked down to the stage where it needs its final tillering to become a bow. And right now you'll notice that it is basically straight from one end to another. Well, when you bend this piece of wood, any piece of wood, uh, when this is bent, don't bend it too far right now, but when she's bent, what happens is the outside of this wood is trying to tear apart. The inside is really just compressing, pushing together on itself, compression. These are the two major factors that control bows. A third, which is not really worth much or worried about much in wooden bows, a third uh, principle is the center of the bow, which has nothing happening. It's called the neutral plane. In the bows we're building here, it has a lot to do. But on wooden bows, it, you don't worry much about that. But a piece of wood, when you bend this, eventually is going to blow apart if you bend it too far, regardless of the piece of wood. And most woods will fail under the compression. The inside of the bend before they will tear apart at the back. But either way, you have, what, 1%? About a 1% strain in the wood. And what that means is that if you have a piece of wood, say, 100 inches long, you can either stretch it or compress it by one inch, which is 1% of its total length, before it fails under the particular strain that you're giving it. If you are stretching it, a 100-inch piece of wood will break after it's been stretched to 101 inches. And so that's the limiting factor in bow design often, is, is making a bow that will bend to the proper draw length for your arrows and still be within some sort of safety margin for the materials. So, when we finish this bow, and then I shoot it, I bend it, 
compressive forces are going to take over and it is going to end up with what we call a set. It won't be straight anymore. It will be bent slightly towards the belly of the bow or towards the shooter. This is the back side. This is the belly side down here and the string would be running down along here. So the bottom bow was straight when I began. It compressed. There's ways to counteract that somewhat, but for what we're talking, you don't need to know that. You can build your bow with what we call a reflex. Bend it backwards so that when you string this bow, you have it strung, you have more energy stored with a bow that is bent backwards and one that's bent forwards. One that has string follow or reflex. So, ideally, if these were all the same bow, basically the same size configuration and woods, and same poundage bows, let's say 50 pounds, the one that would shoot hardest and furthest would be the one before stringing that had the most reflex. And the one that had the most deflex, or string foul, would not be as efficient as these other two. Now, as Jeff mentioned, you would has. Now, this top bow here, it's reflex. You see this fuzzy stuff that is sinew. It's been sinew back. We're going to talk about this in our composite bows. Well, let's go back to our basic plain bow. Uh, One percent, you can stress this. In other words, we could stretch it or compress it. One uh, percent. Now, that doesn't give us much. It makes good bows. They've shot for years and years, the English longbows and uh, Native Americans and all around the world. Most cultures used wooden bows. They still are today, and they work really, really efficiently. Uh, but you can only stress this to a certain extent. You can only bend it so far. So if I wanted to really reflex this bow to get the most out of it, a piece of wood, what if I reflexed it way back, like eight or nine inches? backwards. It would probably break before I got the string on it. Because just in getting it to the point where it's straightened out, you would be straining the wood on the belly side and the back side by your 1%, and the bow will probably not take any more than that. So it'll break before you even get it to this point, trying so to put a string on it. So you can get a really fantastic bow out of just a piece of wood. This bow here is a 100 pound bow. I can't draw it completely. That's with a 23 inch arrow. And it has thrown what, 260 grain arrow that one you sent me? Mm -hmm. it, it's thrown a flight arrow that Jeff sent me over 300 yards. We lost it as it went into treetops at about 15 or 20 feet in the air and it was 320 yards. So this thing can throw an arrow a considerable distance. And that would be a tremendous shot for an English longbow, by the way. This is 48 inches long. Now, let's improve on this bow. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take some horn. This is horn of a Gemsbach. Comes from Africa. It's been sawn in two. This is horn of a buffalo. Made a Native American bison. And this would work for making a bow. And this is horn from what, Asian water buffalo. This is a strip of Asian water buffalo horn, the inside curve. Uh, this is what Jeff builds most of his bows from. This we use on the underside of the bow, the belly, the side that faces the archer when you draw it, that is under compression. Because this has four times, five times the compressor for wood? About. This can take an overall strain of 4%, which means that the bow can be reflexed before uh, being strung, and it can be drawn farther after being strung, uh, roughly four times the curvature of a limb of a wooden bow, and still fall safely within the limits of the material. But if you bend this, it's going to break before it goes any great distance, because it doesn't have tension. It won't stretch. Mm -hmm. 
even as well as wood, will it? No, it will not. Uh, the trick is to make sure that the horn, which can withstand compression, is placed on the bow in such a place that it will have to withstand only compression, not tension. Okay. So, so this by itself isn't going to make much of a bow because you are back to this if you had a piece of wood. With the exception, you would be able to bend it further if the back didn't go apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to take sinew, tendon from animals, and this is off the back strap of uh, a deer, and we're going to shred this out into threads. And we're going to glue this on the back of a bow. Let me grab a strip of horn. This is just exactly the one I put down uh, that has been shaped, and we'll show you this later, uh, by heat, moist heat, and it's been flattened. So this is one limb of a bow. This is another limb of a bow. And all we need to do is place sinew on the back side with a reflex and get a reflex. Uh, this is simple composite bow. Jeff's got one here he's going to show and you. This is <laughs> the type of reflex that you end up with. This is an extreme case. Uh, the bow looks a little bit out of balance right now, but when it's strung up, the limbs are balanced extremely well. This bow was nearly straight before it was sinewed and reflexed, and the shrinkage of the sinew alone has pulled it into this shape. Now, as you can see, you're going to have to exert an enormous amount of force and put a lot of energy into the bow just to straighten out the limbs. And that's energy that will be stored in this bow above and beyond what could have been stored in a straight limb bow. Then, in addition to that, this bow, being nevertheless quite short along the curve, can be bent tremendously far and shoot a very long arrow because the materials are so extremely flexible compared to wood. It can take an overall four times or five times as great a curvature as a normal wooden bow. Now, this bow would probably not be efficient if it were not reflexed because the horn and the sinew are both denser than wood. So this bow, as it stands, is heavier and weighs more physically than a bow made out of wood of exactly the same shape. That slows a bow down. When you make a bow, the material you make it out of automatically slows down its operation. So you want lightest material you can or you use what physics you can to make it as efficient as possible. So by placing in that bow that Jeff just held up, two weeks, three weeks? This one was sinewed two weeks ago. Uh, and he's had it strung. And we're going to string it again later. You'll see it later in the video. Hopefully we'll get to that point if we don't run out of time. But this will be bent. If you took a piece of wood like this, you'd never even get it straight. It would explode. It wouldn't make it. Horn on the belly. Sinew on the back. The sinew stretches five times maybe the amount of wood. The horn compresses that much. And so you can do fantastic stuff. We will show you here. This is what, Turkish? This one is Indian. Indian. Indian subcontinent. Uh, a bow. This is reflexed. This is backwards from what it would be when it's strung. And you couldn't take a piece of wood that is in this shape and do anything without it exploding. It would just blow up on you. I'm going to put this down just a moment and grab this because there's one concept on the other bow which we'll cover in a second. This is just the tip where the string will be placed. This is the other tip, but it's going to be bent backwards. If we did this